Ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's get started. We've got a terrific presentation tonight. My name is David Iglesias. I'm the director of the Wheaton Center for Faith, Politics, and Economics. Uh, we are going to be listening from uh, Mr. Steve Preston. Quick bio, a couple of introductory comments, and then we'll let Mr. Preston have the days. Uh, Mr. Preston is a Wheaton husband and a Wheaton father of a grad and a Wheaton father of a current student, so he knows all things Wheaton. He graduated with highest distinction from Northwestern University and received his MBA from the University of Chicago. He worked with the Service Master Company as CFO and Executive Vice President. Then he uh, was appointed to become the administrator of the SBA or the Small Business Administration under the George W. Bush administration. Uh, he worked on the Hurricane Katrina uh, relief efforts from a SBA perspective. He uh, finished up his term at HUD or the uh, housing, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and uh, he's had some private sector jobs since then. Uh, he is on the Wheaton Board of Trustees. Uh, he's on my board, Board of Advisors. Uh, let me just end these comments by saying, do you remember where you were in the fall of 2008? You younger people might not. The older people will definitely remember what was going on. Enormous and established firms were failing. Financial firms were failing. It was, uh, to use a uh, plate tectonic analogy, uh, there were some major seismic shifts going on in the United States. And Mr. Preston and his colleagues were tasked with uh, saving our country from financial ruin. And I look forward to hearing his comments tonight. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Steve Preston. Great. Well, thank you for being here. There must not be much going on in town here tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to get into this topic uh, in trying to understand the financial crisis of 2008. And my trying to explain it, you sort of have to achieve a balance between getting into um, complicated issues around the financial markets and regulations and different investment structures and all sorts of things like that on the one hand and just trying to be intelligible on the other because there was so much happening and it was so complex. So tonight I'm going to try and I am going to cover a lot of ground even though I'm just going to be scratching the surface. Um, I've got a lot of charts and graphs. The detail for some of you might be a little overwhelming but I know a lot of you are students in this so I want to achieve the balance. Uh, if it does get confusing don't worry about the detail. Just try to hang with the big messages, because most of what I'm trying to get across are messages. Uh, and, um, uh, and you can be quite confident that any of you students who want to dig into any of these issues much more deeply, let me know that there's so much uh, out there. So I'm going to try to give you a sense of the magnitude of the crisis, um, a deeper look at the mortgage market, which was sort of the culprit that really drove a lot of the crisis, not the only thing. Uh, a sense of some of the other issues that exacerbated the impact. And then I want to give you some observations that you, as future leaders in our country, I think really need to take away from this experience. I realize, as, as uh, David mentioned, many of you students were children during the financial crisis, so I want to make sure that I emphasize right at the front end that these were events that not only dominated a period of time, but they reshaped our country and they had enormous impacts on people's lives. Millions of people lost their savings, millions lost their homes, people lost their jobs, and a lot of people just lost their hope. It was a really tough time, and there was a period where it just didn't seem we could get out of it. Back in 2007, we were beginning to move out of a lengthy period of economic growth and job creation. Uh, we had a sense of flourishing in our country, but relatively quickly, we moved into a time of immense uh, economic turmoil. Um, early in, uh, in October of 2007, that first bar, that's the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is an indicator of the value of the stock market. And back then, it was almost at 1,600 points. A year later, the S&P 500 
was around 900. That was a 40% drop. And only five months later, it had gone down to 700, a 55% drop in the value of our stock market in about a year and a half. So what does that mean? Well, for older people who might have put their life savings for retirement in the stock market, they may have had a $300,000 nest egg that all of a sudden became $150,000. And they really weren't sure how they were going to pay for the retirement after that. Or for parents who had a 529 fund because they were hoping to send their kids to Wheaton, they may have had $100,000 in that. And in a relatively short period of time, that became $50,000, and they didn't know how they were going to send their kids to college. Um, in addition, during that same period of time, it actually the, the green line shows the decline in home values. If you took a little bit further forward, you would see on average they went down 30%. Many markets went down 50 or more. People had more borrowing on their home than their home was worth. So this was enormously difficult. In the meantime, millions of people would lose their home. This is a, a, a graph of home foreclosures. Home foreclosures are when People stop paying their loans and the bank has a right to take those homes away from them. And you can see at 2005, it was about 500,000, but by the time we got to 2008, it was over 2 million, and for two years, or it was almost 3 million. These are enormous numbers. Um, major banks, if you could go to the next one, major banks and financial institutions began to fail. For years, we just didn't even talk about bank failures, but that green line shows you the number of banks failing going from 2007 to 2010, the orange line is a little bit different look at it. It talks about the value of those banks. So the big spike is some very big banks failed. But fundamentally, the stability of our financial system was at risk. And then, in addition, nearly 9 million people lost their job. And I can't think of a more devastating impact than that. Let's just go to the next one. Uh, it just felt like the economic system was melting down. It just kept getting worse, and it was despite the largest federal response probably in the history of the world. Um, and so how did all this just transpire? What did happen, and what did we do about it? If you're interested in sort of insider accounts, both of the Treasury secretaries, Paulson and later Geithner, uh, wrote books about this. Ben Bernanke wrote a book about it. They give great insights from what it felt like on the inside. In fact, all three of them were on a panel last week at the Brookings Institute. You can probably get that online. And then there are a lot of other viewpoints uh, on what happened, but there's plenty out there. Now, in terms of my own exposure, as David mentioned, I came to Washington as head of the Small Business Administration. And the Small Business Administration does a lot to help small businesses get capital and other kinds of support so they can start a business and so they can grow their business. So my vantage point as this stuff was cooking up was I got to see how small businesses were doing and if they were able to borrow and what was happening in their world. And I began to see that stress through that lens. Um, interestingly, I actually said to our uh, very senior person who I won't name, I'm seeing it in small business. I'm concerned this is about more than mortgages. Even in late 2007, the reply I got, no, this is really contained to mortgages. It's not going to get bigger, we don't think. Well, sure enough, um, it, it, it did get bigger. And when the financial crisis was in full swing and the federal response was ramping up, that's when I was asked to go over to run the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Now, both because many of the causes of the crisis and many of the devastating impacts of the crisis had to do with the housing market, HUD was going to be in the middle of some of the most hotly debated issues in Congress. Uh, I would serve on the board of the TARP, which I'll describe in a minute, and the demand for numerous HUD pro programs that help homeowners exploded. So for me, this was kind of like, it was really like riding on a Bronco, right? This was just a crazy time. Uh, and, but also a time of, uh, I have to say, uh, tremendous blessing in, in, in other ways. So as I implied earlier, coming into 2007, the country had been in a relatively uh, good place. Uh, the economy was growing nicely, steadily, not huge, but pretty steadily. The job market was pretty good. Unemployment had been under 5% for years. But on the other hand, the market for buying and selling homes was going like crazy. In 04, it was up. 16%, 05, it was up 15%, 06, it was still steady, and the stock market was booming. So it kind of felt like the economy growth was out of sync with the asset growth, which was growing much more quickly. Um, now, interestingly, back in 2005, and remember what I said is this started really coming into fruition later in 2007. 
So back in 2005, a good two and a half to three years before things started falling apart, Alan Greenspan, who had been the chairman of the Federal Reserve, began to express concern. And for those students who don't know what the Federal Reserve is, that's our central bank. They have a big impact on our economy. They affect interest rates, and they're very much in the middle of these issues. Now, by this point, Alan Greenspan's tenure had been already 18 years as Fed chair. He had spanned four presidents. He was enormously respected, and he was sort of like the Yoda of economic wisdom, right? When he spoke, in fact, I won't get into it, but a few years later, he, he gave caution to the stock market and the whole thing plummeted, right? So he was very careful about how he said things by this point. And he said in 2005, history cautions that people experiencing long periods of relative stability are prone to excess. So he was basically saying, I'm concerned this is gonna get aggressive because things have been so steady and people are gonna start reaching. That was his caution, okay? Later that year, he suggested that people were actually paying too much for stocks and bonds and houses and trying to get them to think about the risk out there. And then not long after that, he came right out and warned about the excesses in the housing market. So before any of this stuff happened, the real sage of our financial market was beginning to sound the alarm bell with increasing volumes. So what was happening? And what were the conditions that many economists believe contributed to the growth of share prices and housing prices? Now, I'll be the first one to say I am not an economist. There are a lot of economists on this campus. Um, and uh, I would ask you students to go to them for deeper uh, and, and, and more reasoned views on some of this stuff. But I would tell you that most people agree that there were numerous uh, contributing factors, some of which included the following. So I'll go through some of, the, some of the theories here. I think these all contributed to it. First of all, our central bank had kept interest rates very low for a long period of time to help our country recover after the 9-11 attacks, which were in 2001. Company, country really plummeted after that. Fed wanted to kind of get things going, and they kept interest rates low for a long time. And what low borrowing costs can do is fuel higher asset prices. It's cheap to borrow that money, you can invest it, and some people said that fueled the stock market and the housing market. In addition, there was a lot of foreign money that was coming into our country looking to invest. Saving levels were very high in foreign countries, the investment opportunities looked very good in the US, and more money coming into the market usually means more demand for assets and prices go up, okay? Many people have also argued that the government pushed financial institutions, especially Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, to take too much risk by helping to increase lending to lower income people and lending to areas of our country that, that are difficult uh, economically. Now, for those of you who don't know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are two massive companies that were uh, institutionalized by the Federal Government Act, actually, that guarantee mortgages um, so that we can get more capital to people. And I can get into that in more detail. Um, I won't do that right now. But what I want to say is people were saying this was partially the government's fault. There's a lot of disagreement around that. Um, and that's something we can talk about later as well. And then finally, Ben Bernanke in his book actually says some of the growth he thought was just psychology. Uh, with the market and the home values booming, people just wanted to get part of the action. You know, they see the housing prices going up, they want to buy a bigger house. They see the stock market going up, they want to jump on the ride. And he believes that's part of what fueled it as well. But I have to tell you, beyond all of these factors, in the housing market, there was something much more nefarious at work. The growth in very risky and often deceptive mortgage lending practices began to take off. Now, years ago, when you wanted to buy a house, you would go to your local bank for a home loan known as a mortgage. And uh, here you see a happy young couple. They have been overwhelmed by the ring by spring syndrome. And they are now looking to purchase a home. Are these guys in the room by any chance? OK. I wanted to thank them for this. <laughs> then you would go actually to your local banker, typically, to get a loan. And apparently, they have a particularly, <laughs> apparently they have a particularly discerning banker. And that person would provide the happy couple 
with, um, first of all, the happy couple would provide the banker with all sorts of financial institutions. The banker would analyze it and determine if they would get a loan, and they would lend you the money, and every month you would pay, pay your uh, payments to the bank. They would take the risk. Maybe if you had a problem with your mortgage, you'd probably sit down with your banker and work something out, but it was something where the banks held the risk, they had the relationship, and they worked with you. However, beginning in the 1980s, our system of mortgage lending evolved in an effort to actually make it more efficient and to bring interest rates down and expand home ownership and actually allow more investors other than just those banks to have the opportunity to invest in mortgages. This process was called securitization, okay? So you would, um, the happy couple would come in and they would contact, in many cases, a mortgage broker. Now, it's the mortgage broker's job to find the uh, people, uh, the home loan that works for them, good interest rate, good terms, and they would probably talk to a bank uh, who would provide that to them. Um, this process is known as loan origination, getting the loan to the happy couple. The broker got a fee, the bank got a fee, and typically the bank didn't keep the loan, the bank sold it to somebody we're gonna call a packager. Now, and then the bank, got a fee, and they moved it into here. Now this packager would buy thousands of mortgages and blend them all together. And then they would sell securities to investors. And those investors would earn a return based on all of the payments coming into that mortgage pool, right? So in other words, the happy couple was paying the packager, it would go into that pool, and those payments would go to investors along with a lot of other people's mortgages. The third-party packager also paid a firm called the rating agency, or a credit rating agency, Moody, Standard & Poor's, Fitch. And that agency would analyze those loans, and they would ascribe a credit rating to it. They would say to the investors, we have analyzed all these loans, and we think they're great. And if they're top tier, we're going to call them AAA, right? And that's the best rating. So now those investors actually own your mortgage, they don't know you, they didn't review your case, they're not monitoring you. Uh, generally, they relied almost entirely on the work of the rating agencies to assess the quality of the securities. And investors, these investors, the dollar sign, they could have been banks, pension funds, mutual funds, foreign banks, individuals, they were all over the world in all sorts of people's hands. And as that market grew, there were trillions of dollars of these securities in the hands of investors. So. What happened? Well, there was tremendous pressure during that period, 04, 05, and 06, for the housing market to stay strong because it was a great market for a lot of, a lot of industries. You know, home builders by this point were selling a lot of new homes. In fact, they were selling almost a million homes a year, creating jobs, it was a great industry. Um, it was good for homeowners. Now, it wasn't always great for homeowners for the best reasons, but let me tell you how some of this could work. I'm just gonna take a little bit of a, of, a, of a digression here. If your home increased in value, let's say the value of your home went up by $100,000, the bank would actually say, you know what, your home's worth more now, I'll make you another loan against that house or increase the value of your loan, and you can get that cash out and buy a car, buy furniture, you can do whatever. Those were called second mortgages, or they would just increase the value of your mortgage. And that actually became important fuel for the economy. It was also good for other players in the residential industry, like realtors and lenders and all these people in the diagram. And it was good for investors, at least for a period of time. However, at a time when the natural forces in the economy might have begun to slow things down, the market for mortgages was kept alive by taking greater risk, by more aggressive lending practices, and I think ultimately in many ways by negligence and deception mostly surrounding what people know as subprime mortgages. Now, the term subprime mortgage refers to a loan which is generally greater risk. And it's generally because the borrower might not have great credit history, they may have the lower income, or the home might just be fairly expensive relative to their income. Subprime loans are not inherently bad. They've been an important vehicle to help people get homes who couldn't get homes otherwise. And many of them have paid them, right? But you can see by the next slide that subprime loans as a percentage of our mortgage market skyrocketed during 04 to 06, the period when things really began to ramp up. 
Um, and so in a very short period of time, they became an enormous force in the market. In addition, not only did the number of subprime loans go up, but the way they were designed, the features that were inherent in those loans made them even riskier. You see, many of them, if you go to the next slide, historically, when you went to your bank, you gave them all sorts of financial information. You gave them a ton of information. More and more, the borrowers were saying, I really don't need much information. Just give me a couple things. We call those low doc loans, low document. In some cases, they didn't need anything. They used a credit score. Historically, you used to put a lot of money down to buy a house. If you bought a $200,000 house, you might need to put 30,000 of your savings in it and, and finance the rest. More and more people were saying, you, don't, you can only put a little bit of money down and just borrow the rest. Or maybe I'll lend you your down payment. You can borrow the whole thing. And as a result, homeowners didn't have any skin in the game. They could walk away from their home and not have anything that they lost. A huge culprit was something called teaser rates, temporarily low rates. Nine out of 10 subprime loans had payments that started very low for the first couple of years to entice people in, and then after two years, those loan payments would go way up. And in many cases, that's when we saw people begin to fail. And then more and more, because of the second loan uh, mortgage phenomenon I mentioned, more and more people borrowed more and more money against their house. So the way these loans were structured became riskier, and the amount of them became much larger. Now, I'm going to just say a few things that are, that are more complicated. If you don't understand this next part, you can just kind of zone out for a second. But if you're interested in this stuff, I just want to make a couple of points, which are, can you um, go to the next slide? These mortgages ended up getting carved up into multiple pieces. So your, mortgages might, your mortgage payment might be going to three different investors. And then those investor securities were getting divided up and put into other securities which were called collateralized debt obligations. And then people were selling insurance to people to guarantee them or bet against their failure. And then you had something called synthetic securities where people would effectively bet on the winning or the failure of this whole market. It got crazy. And it just, um, it just amplified the risk. And in some cases, the investments got so complicated that a lot of people really did not even understand what they were investing in. And I'm getting so hot telling this story, I think I need to take my jacket off. So I'm just going to put it over here. Phew, give me some water. So how then did things transpire? Because you can see it was getting kind of messy. I want to give you a sense of the chain of events that will demonstrate <coughs> excuse me, how the mortgage market contributed to the crisis. Increasingly, these people got behind in their loan payments or just stopped paying their mortgages altogether. In many cases, as I mentioned, it was because of that low introductory rate that went up. Because people weren't paying on their loans, the value of the mortgage-backed securities to those investors began to decline because there was risk that they wouldn't get their money back. And in addition, a lot of those investors started saying, I'm really not sure what these things even are. I'm not sure I even get them. And some of them just said, I'm not going to buy these anymore, even if they do look good, because I don't trust them. So the demand for mortgage-backed securities and similar investments began to decline. Well, and the prices plummeted because people lost their trust in them. And very importantly, as, uh, as prices plummeted because of that lack of trust, the, to trace that chain backwards, there was less money available for the happy couples to purchase houses. So loan volume tightened up. And with less money available for loans, fewer people were buying houses. Housing prices began to decline further because there was more supply than demand. And because housing prices were no longer going up, people were taking less money out of their houses. It reduced consumer spending, which was important to the economy. And because financial institutions owned so many of these mortgage-backed securities or other instruments like them, those institutions began to lose a lot of money. And because they were losing a lot of money, other banks that were lending to them began to lose confidence and began saying, I'm not going to lend you money anymore. And that's the money, in many cases, that had been used to buy these loans. So you might have gotten your ring by spring, but there was not going to be a house for your spouse. Okay? <laughs> it's my only other joke, OK? So, I know that's a lot to 
that's a lot to digest, but there was a chain of events here that's important to understand. So as, as this stuff started ramping up, it sort, of, it, it sort of began to ramp and then took an absolutely feverish pace in terms of what we saw. So I just, I'm just going to give you, you don't have to understand all this. I want to give you a sense of the timeline after this, OK? In 2007, the housing crisis was beginning to deepen. These events were beginning to kick in. And Freddie Mac, who's one of the big mortgage companies, announces to the world, we are not buying any more risky subprime loans. It was a huge message a big lack of confidence in the market that knocked things down. In the same year, three large mortgage lenders either went bankrupt or got downgraded significantly, which indicated that they may be on the way to get getting bankrupt. So there was a huge, there was a significant indication that the subprime market was a big problem. Then you get into early 2008. By this point, the economy is going into recession. Um, subprime market begins to infect the other markets. And you see some other things. B of A ends up buying Countrywide, which is a big mortgage company, to avoid it from failing. Bear Stearns, our fifth largest investment bank, is about to go under. The feds guarantee 30 billion of their assets, and JP Morgan buys them to save them. Federal regulators seize IndyMac. IndyMac is the largest thrift institution in the country, which is another kind of insti financial institution like a bank. Things are really heating up. Then September hits. Don't even look at the labels. Look at these dates, OK? Look at these dates. And let me tell you what's happening here, OK? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are taken over by the government, September 7th. They, they were guaranteeing over $5 trillion of mortgages. September 15th, Lehman Brothers, our fourth largest investment bank, files for bankruptcy. Merrill Lynch, our third largest investment bank, gets bought by B of A to avoid going bankrupt. Next day, AIG, largest insurance company in the world, gets $85 billion from the federal government to avoid going under. Five days later, the two most prestigious investment banks in the world get converted from investment banks to com commercial banks, which brings them under certain federal protections. I won't get into the detail. Effectively bolstering confidence in them and saving them. And what's happened in the course of a week as the four largest investment banks in the country have either gone bankrupt, gotten bought, or turned into banks. The, that, that whole industry effectively went away. Um, further on, um, regulators closed Was Washington Mutual Bank. That was the, the largest bank failure in history. Four days later, we got a four-day breather on that one. Then, at this time, the federal government was negotiating with Congress wildly to negotiate a package where we could invest money into these banks to save them from going under. This was called the TARP. And it was going back and forth. And on the 29th, Congress voted down the TARP. The market plummets 800 points, places in turmoil. A few days later, Congress comes back, approves it. And that gives the federal government significant ability to begin uh, addressing the crisis. And on the same day, Wells Fargo buys Wachovia, another huge bank, to save that from going under. And then a couple, few weeks later, what happens? GM, Ford, and Chrysler, our three massive uh, um, car companies, all tell Congress that they think they need loans to survive. And then a few, weeks, a few days later, the feds come in with a, um, with a $300 billion package to save Citibank. Okay, you guys know what Citibank is, right? It was incredible. And it was just happening so quickly. It's, and um, so people did not see it coming. Financial institutions found themselves in this crisis. The federal government, the regulators, Congress, the White House were all increasingly scrambling to figure it out. Uh, they were trying to figure out what the problem was, how deep it was, and what we could actually do about it. It felt like having a patient where you sort of start out with the vital signs. Like, oh, let's treat it this way. I can see what's going on. Well, that doesn't work. So then you take a bunch of tests. And you give the patient more treatment. And that doesn't work. Well, then you open the patient up, and you take a biopsy, and you see what's happening, and you realize the magnitude of the issue. So you start out with surgery. And then you give medication to address the underlying issue. And then you give them more treatments to kind of keep all their vital signs OK. And then you bring in the psychologist to make, make sure that they've got the, the, the stage of mind to, you know, to kind of keep fighting. It was all going on at the same time. And the magnitude and the complexity of the issue was not sufficiently understood until the crisis was absolutely on top of us, OK? 
And in our case, taking the metaphor a little bit further, in treating our patient, our regulatory structure made it more difficult. It wasn't robust. It wasn't coordinated. Um, you've heard me mention a number of financial institutions on that list. Let me just kind of give you a, a snapshot. There were banks. There were investment banks. There were non-bank mortgage lenders. There were thrift companies, insurance companies, government-sponsored enterprises, which were Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Those are all different kinds of financial institutions. And you don't need to know what they all are, but what's important is they all have different rules that govern them. They all have different regulators that oversee them. They all have different restrictions on what they're allowed to do and how they can operate. And as a result, they don't have the same level of stringency in managing them. And also as a result, it was really difficult to coordinate the response across all of these financial institutions. Um, and it just made it more difficult. So let's take a step back now and talk about what the government did. And many of you have heard the term government bailout. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sense of what that is. But before I do that, we need to take a crisis timeout. <laughs> and I'm going to do a little bit of backgrounder for a lot of you who aren't, um, uh, to get, give you a sense of some of the financial structure that we had to go after. Now, how many of you guys uh, know what a balance sheet is on a financial statement, kind of how it's constructed? OK. So I'm going to go take a step back, and I'm going to describe for you what a balance sheet is. And if you go to the next slide, if you would, thank you. So a balance sheet describes three things. It describes what you own, your assets, what you owe, your liabilities, and the difference between the two, which is called your equity or your net worth. And I'm going to start with like a simple family balance sheet. This is like super simple, OK? But I want you to get the idea. And here we have a family that's got um, 20,000 in cash, 80,000 in investments, their car's worth 30,000, their home's worth 270,000, and so their assets are worth $400,000. And if they sell everything, they're gonna have $400,000. However, they owe 10,000 in credit card debt, 20,000 in car loan, and $220,000 mortgage for a total of 250. So their assets are 400, they owe 250. If they sell their assets and repay their liabilities, they have 150 left over. That's their equity or their net worth. Now, what happens if their home burns down and they don't have insurance, right? The assets go down by 270. Your debt, unfortunately, does not change. And your equity is going to go down. And your equity is going to go negative 120. So all of a sudden, you owe more than your stuff. That's not a good situation, right? So let's take this analogy now to a financial institution. And this is a super simplification. If anybody worked for financial institutions, I apologize. But the only thing I want to mention here is in a bank, most of its assets are investments. It's financial stuff, right? They might have $15 billion in cash. I've got $5 billion for plant and equipment. Let's say they had $80 billion in mortgage-backed securities and $200 million in other assets. And so they had $300 billion in assets. Now, what they use to buy those assets with is on the liability side. They may take deposits in their saving, savings and checking accounts for 50. They may borrow short-term loans from other banks, sometimes overnight loans for 100, long-term loans for 100. That gives them 250. And the equity, the difference between your assets and what you owe, 300, 250, is 50 in equity. And that is what their balance sheet looks like. However, in our discussion, what happens if my mortgage-backed securities decline in value? Bam, it hits my equity, right? If my equity uh, and, and, or my other investments decline. And if my equity declines, people who lend me money, those short-term and long-term loans, begin to worry that I'm not going to survive. They don't want to lend me money anymore. And if they don't want to lend me money and they stop pulling, start pulling those loans, I'm going to have to sell more of this stuff to pay down those loans, which pressures the value of those further. Um, and if the market doesn't trust those MBSs, it becomes very difficult to find a buyer. The value declines more. My equity declines more. Trust in the bank declines more. And it's a, it's a very difficult situation. The market is heavily predicated on trust and confidence. Our biggest enemy in a market like this is the erosion of trust because 
People begin pulling away their funding and everything falls apart. And the lack of trust drove the value of those instruments down more and investors pulled their support. So what did the federal government do in response to this? Number one, do you like that, the way you those graphics? Elise Alexander did these slides. Where are you, Elise? <laughs> She's somewhere in here. Um, the best known was something called the Troubled Asset Relief, Relief Program, or the TARP. That's the one that I was on the board of. The White House and Congress worked together to, um, uh, to fund a $700 billion relief fund. Just a moment of pause. The White House and Congress worked together. I know that's a shocking concept. And, um, and that fund was used to inject in the equity of banks, right? So as that equity was declining and people were concerned it was going to decline further, this gave investors trust that the banks would survive because they got equity. In addition, the FDIC, which is a federal regulator, guaranteed the repayment of many deposits over and above what they already do and many loans. So if I'm a bank and I'm lending to another bank and I'm going to pull my money out, the FDIC said, don't do it. We will guarantee good payment. We want this bank to survive. Please stay in there. I believe it was this lack of stability which was a primary accelerator for both Bear Stearns and Lehman, even though there were deep underlying problems. And then the third thing was, in addition to the certainty that the FDIC gave, was the Fed began purchasing securities, purchasing assets like mortgage-backed securities and other investments in the market. And remember I said people didn't want to buy these anymore because they didn't trust them. And the Fed basically said, we'll make a market. We'll start buying these things. And that'll prop up the prices. And it'll ensure pe help people understand that if they own them, somebody will be around to purchase them. So we re-equitized the banks providing trust. We guaranteed their loans, which gave certainty to lenders. And we uh, provided demand for securities in the market, which kept those values more robust. That was a three-prong um, a response that was in the height of the crisis that really stabilized the financial institutions. Now, as we went beyond that, there were many other things. You know, in 2009, the government uh, appropriated an $800 billion um, stimulus package, and all sorts of other things happened later. But in the crux of the crisis, this is what happened to slow it all down. Now, many people like to vilify one group or the other. Uh, in this whole process, ascribing blame for, you know, for the whole thing. People like to point their fingers at bankers, the government, Fannie, Freddie, but there are a lot of factors that launched us into this crisis. However, there is one thing that I believe very strongly, and that is that there was a moral breakdown across the system that contributed to this crisis. You had people borrowing money who were either defrauded, didn't understand, or were taking undue risk. A lot of things happening. You had mortgage brokers and, and, you know, in some cases, banks pushing these horrific loans on lenders, knowing full well that they probably weren't going to be able to pay. You had mortgage packagers who sold mortgage-backed bonds to investors for fees, not a lot of risk to themselves. Many of them didn't really understand. <laughs> I think a lot of these people didn't fully understand the quality of what they were doing, but there's evidence that some of them did and that they knew the quality was declining significantly and continued with it. And you had in credit rating agencies that put their reputation on the line by fixing high credit ratings to securities that they really didn't understand. They didn't put enough rigor to it. And their job, their only job, was to protect those investors. OK? Now, I am not saying that everybody was bad. It's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that there there were every part of this industry, there were people that were complicit. And if a critical mass of players had pulled back and raised their hand, the system would have slowed down before we came to the break. The system would have slowed down, I believe, before we hit the wall. But it kept churning. And this is relevant for you all as future leaders in our country, as future leaders in financial institutions, government, industry. You are going to find yourself in places when a sense of true north and conviction needs to be at the top of your mind and you're going to need to step forward. And it might be a financial issue. It might be a policy issue. It might be an issue of employee fairness. But we need leaders in all sectors who can stand tall 
for the right thing. And I believe if we'd had more of them in this situation, we would have staved off the crisis. Second, many things have improved since then. We have much stronger regulation. I do believe we have better oversight for financial institutions. They're better, they're better capitalized. They have more equity. We have stronger consumer protections. And um, so a big uh, step forward has, has taken place there. But third, there are leftover issues. And some of them are very concerning. And I want to bring up one that concerns me particularly. And that is, in my view, the fact that our government continues to spend way more money than it takes in. We call that the deficit. During the crisis and after the crisis, we saw a staggering growth in federal debt. That's the amount of money that we borrow as a country. And our debt went up because we were spending more than we made. Much of that money was spent to address the crisis. However, we continued to have large annual deficits way after the crisis. And the federal deficit is, continued, is projected to continue to grow well into the future. Let's take a snapshot of that. In 2000, when, uh, just before George Bush was coming into office, our federal debt in that first column was just under $6 trillion. That was about 55% of our GDP. Once again, GDP is what our country produces every year. And that's just sort of a comparison, right? That was about $20,000 per person in our country, right? Eight years later, uh, as President Bush was about to leave office, that debt had gone up to $10 trillion as a result of the financial crisis the, uh, the, and the, um, the wars overseas. It was now 68% of GDP and almost $33,000 a person. When President Obama left office, large stimulus package, very significant deficit spending for eight years, it went up to almost $20 trillion. Okay, So in 16 years, we're going from 5.7 to almost 20 trillion. It's now more than the entire GDP of our country. And it's $60,000 a person. And last year, if you look at, I don't, this is about a year old. If you look at the projections for eight years forward from there, it's projected to go to 29 trillion, which is 144% in the, higher than Italy or Portugal, just by the way. And that's about $83,000 a person. So, um, very big, obviously. Two things are going to happen during this period of time and continue to happen that are going to contribute to the problem and potentially exacerbate it. First, programs for the aging. People like me are retiring, OK? Uh, the baby boomers is a big group. Medicare and Social Security are going to increase. And these represent massive amounts of our federal budget, and they're growing. They're called entitlement programs because it means that people are entitled to receive benefits irrespective of whether or not we you know, have a budget for it. I mean, if it's part of the federal, it's required to be part of the federal budget, right? Unless we change the programs. We've known it for many years. It's just getting worse. Secondly, because that debt is going up, the interest cost on that debt is going up. And it could go up even more dramatically because rates are very low right now. And if interest rates go up, as well as the amount going up, it's going to be even worse. So entitlements and debt costs are projected to become an increasingly large part of our budget. Well, what does that look like? The green is, is what we call mandatory spending. That's the Medicare, the Social Security, and a few other things. Uh, it's about two-thirds of our spending. This is 2015, so it's probably a little bit more by now. Interest on the debt is only about 6%. Um, but in our projection, that could become much more. And then we have 29% for things we call discretionary. This is really what Congress decides every year. This is what we're going to spend money on. So let's look at that 29% in more detail. Over half of that goes to the military. So of that 29%, only 46% of that 29% which is, what, 13% or something, goes for things like um, transport to infrastructure, bridges, ports, things like that that help our economy flourish, um, education spending, programs for the poor, medical research. All of these programs are potentially going to be getting less money, um, which effectively invest in the well-being of our country unless we bring those entitlement costs down we increase taxes significantly, which has other consequences, or we borrow even more money, which would make the problem worse. Now, let me just say, if our, if our economy grows robustly, some of this 
We grow out of some of it because more taxes get generated. But I think this, the scale of this problem is going to require a different kind of response. Now, people often lament by using the phrase, our children are going to end up paying for it. That is true, but it's not, I don't think of it as an issue of their pocketbook. I think of it as an issue of the health of our society. Because programs that invest in our society are what's going to suffer. And I believe, I'm saying this especially for you students, that you cannot say you care about the poor or you care about safe communities, or you say it care about a thriving market for jobs, or educational funding, or having infrastructure that provides clean water and safe roads without caring about whether our country, and by the way, our state and our city, have the ability to provide those services, right? And by the way, our state has the lowest credit rating of any state in the country. Um, it's not fair to call for more funding unless you have a view on where it's going to come from, right? And what we're going to do about that. And I believe that's an issue of morality. You're all students of politics and economics, and I urge all of you to look into these issues with rigor, pushing beyond the high-level narratives that a lot of smart people will give you, and engage in vigorous, fact-based, always civil and respectful debate. Um, because this is an issue that should inform how you view our social programs, how you view tax and fiscal policy, what you think about the role of government, and ultimately how you should vote. And I'm not telling you one way or the other, I'm just telling you, you gotta look at this when you want other stuff. So in closing, I want you to ask, and I'm happy to take questions when we're done, what are the issues that dominate our news today? What are the issues that are most central to the future well-being of our country? Do those sync up? They did not 12 years ago in one very critical way. And I don't think they sync up today. And um, what, what do you believe and what is, the, what is the depth of your convictions on your political issues and how will all of this inform those? And what will you do about it? So that's it. Thank you. I just want to say it was 44 minutes and 10 seconds. You told me 45, so it was. I was tracking that. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> that, Three minutes. That was my real accomplishment here. Yes. Uh, th Steve, thank you so much. So, so ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, our high-tech solution, Slido, is out. And given the size of this crowd and given the uh, hour, why don't we go the old-fashioned route and ask questions uh, orally? But as a former trial lawyer, I will object if your question is multi-part or confusing or, or argumentative. And, a, and unless you're running for Congress, please do not make a speech. Just ask Mr. Preston a question. So please, questions in the back, sir. Um, yeah, so I'm not a, an economics or a politics student uh, at all. I, this is just for fun. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> But I remember talking last year when I took econ about Richard Thaler as a, as a behaviorist and his work on this. And he says that a large part of the responsibility lies with the consumer, the happy couple buying houses. Um, yeah. Do you believe that that's true? Yeah, so I spent a lot of time on this issue because a lot of what I did was work on programs to help people save, save their homes and stay in their homes. There were a lot of people that were part of the that bought what they shouldn't have bought, they breached too far, and there was a lack of responsibility. However, there is clear evidence that there were deceptive lending practices in many cases. The loans were very hard to understand. And honestly, the disclosure forms were hard to understand as well. And one of the things we tried to do when I was at HUD is revise the disclosure forms so that when you go in, I don't know, I've moved a lot, so we've bought a lot of homes. I mean, I'm a former CFO and a finance MBA, and I don't even know what I'm signing. Right? It's so complicated. And so a lot of these people, um, I don't really think knew what they were getting into. And then when you, and I've, I've spoken with dozens of them in, in mortgage counseling. So I think, I think it really runs the gamut. But I would not, in, by any means, put it all on the consumer. I would put part of it. Paulson? Oh, uh, Greenspan. Yeah. 
No, I, I, so this is, you know, I, I, so I came into HUD in June of 08, and I worked extensively with Hank Paulson's team and Ben Bernanke's team to get all the data and try to understand all these structures and what was going on. And even at that point, the message I got was, you have to realize this data is new. We are, we just, it just in the last few months, have we begun to pull all this stuff together and really even know what was out there and how many of these, a lot of these things weren't tracked. Um, people didn't know like who owned all the bonds. Um, and I, I won't get into it, but there were layers and layers of complexity that made the, the response difficult. So what I think uh, Greenspan was doing was he was looking at the prices for, more, for homes and the prices for stock relative to the growth in the economy and saying, this is really getting frothy. But I don't think he had visibility into the complexity of the underlying mechanisms that were driving us there. What you guys be aware of loans that were no documents, no income, no money down? People were absolutely aware that those were out there. Okay, uh, because um, I think there were um, okay these things in a free market. I think the view was on some of this stuff. Ultimately, financial institutions are underwriting this. People are buying it. Everybody knows it's there. These are big financial institutions. They're big boys, and they they get what they're buying, right? So I think there was some of that, and I absolutely think the industry got ahead of itself. In other ways, there really wasn't a regulatory structure to come in and say, you've got to have, you've got to have 10% down on your loans, or you've got to have these underwriting standards. There really wasn't, um, at that point, kind of the, the kind of regulatory structure, I think, that would, and I don't think the regulators had a view of superimposing themselves into that degree. Now, when Dodd-Frank came out later, a lot of the detail of how the banks did their business was addressed, sort of chapter and verse. But um, you know, it, it wasn't as if, um, and, the, and by the way, ultimately, the banks weren't owning this stuff. It was those investors at the end. So if, if, I'm, if, I'm, the, uh, if I'm the comptroller of the currency or the Fed or something going into a bank, I'm regulating that bank. Um, you know, they're not retaining those loans. They've got these pools of securities, and they're complicated, and I don't think people always understood what was in them. So it was, I could go on for another 30 minutes on this one, but I, I think there were, a number of, there were a number of things inhibiting that from happening. To prevent a return, so what happened, uh, you indicated that we're having, uh, at that time, uh, a stronger uh, return rules and regulations as far as the bank interest is concerned. Uh, recently, the Volcker um, uh, changes uh, were administered at that time, and other banking laws are being reduced mm -hmm. and changed and loosened <coughs> by our present administration. Yeah. Could you address that? Yeah, so I, um, I am not close enough chapter and verse to exactly what's being rolled back. I will tell you, Dodd-Frank when Dodd-Frank was passed, there were over 300 regulatory missives that went out to the federal agencies to design regulations. And a lot of the banks spent millions of dollars to comply with it. And a lot of it, I think, was actually overreach. Uh, and so I know what the administration is trying to do is pull back on some of those. I just can't tell you because I just don't know if it's going to get to the point where it's not healthy or where it's actually good. I actually do believe one of the most important things we could do is make sure that that equity count in those banks is sufficient. And I would be concerned if the regulations pulled back far enough so that that started getting robbed. But I don't, I don't have enough visibility into all those technicalities. I apologize. Is there a student? Uh, did the repeal of the Black Eagle Act in 1999 contribute to the effects of the crisis? Wow. Um, <laughs> Well, yes, I think it probably contributed, uh, but I don't think, um, man, I'd love to hear some bankers' thoughts on this. I don't think Glass-Steagall would have gotten in the way of this 
securitization rampage because that would have blown right, right past it. The, the investment banks could have done that without the banks. I think the banks were securitizing anyway under Glass-Steagall. The issue between, the issue with Glass-Steagall was the banks couldn't underwrite securities and sell them in the marketplace. So I think it might have tamped it down a little bit, but I don't think it would have been a, it would have been a, you know, a cure. I'd have to think really hard on that one for a while though. Yes, ma'am. So my understanding is that according to government sources, the Great Recession officially ended in June 2009. If that's true, then logically, wow. it would tell me that the policies that brought us out of the recession had to have been developed and implemented by the Bush administration. And that while Obama inherited the Great Recession, he also inherited the solution. Um, I, I, okay, let me uh, try to follow David's rule on, on, as an answer and be concise here. <clears throat> President Bush, I can remember clear as day around the table said, we want to fix this thing before the next administration comes in. We don't want to hand it over to them. Uh, and uh, this happened under our watch and we've got to fix it. So the, the attitude of the president was to do everything he could to get in front of this be before President Obama came into office out of a sense of obligation. So the, that big federal response I talked about, yes, that was all during the Bush administration. A lot of the difficult decisions were made then. After the Obama administration came in, however, um, in early 2009, President Obama uh, and Congress uh, passed the large stimulus package for $800 million, billion dollars, excuse me, that went into the economy. A lot of different views on what that did. Um, I won't expound on that. There are a number of other programs that came in to help homeowners save their home, uh, stuff around the edges to kind of soften the blow. So it, it, there's definitely a lot that happened after President Bush left office, but the, the crux of the rescue um, and, and the decisions, the big congressional decisions that had to get made that got pushed through happened before Obama came in, but like I said, there was a lot that happened after that that addressed different aspects that I think, and in, in, in many of those things, I think, help people a lot. Yes, sir. Uh, with politicians showing unwillingness to address potential programs like security and Medicare and Medicaid, how do you see this problem with the budget deficit solving itself? I, there's, I, I don't really know. I really don't. Uh, uh, I, I, I think there is a, a massive absence of political courage on this one. It's very hard in a campaign to say, I'm going to cut Medicare and I'm going to cut Social Security. But I just want to say, if you retire with a $30 million nest egg, you're going to get Social Security. <laughs> there, there are a lot of ways we can, we can cut those without cutting them for people who need them, right? There are other ways we can work with them over time to, to bring down the cost. So um, it's not an easy solution because you know, a lot of people are getting older and are gonna need those things, but that's the very reason why they need to get fixed, right? Just because they're gonna get bigger. But I don't know, it's gonna be tough. And I, the concern I have, the, the irony is, you all will remember 2010 is when the Tea Party came in. Now the Tea Party wasn't what it was today. The Tea Party came in as a fiscal responsibility type push. And it was after Obama passed uh, the stimulus and people were concerned we were borrowing too much back at like 11 trillion. And now we don't even talk about it, right? So there was at one point a lot of energy around it. And I, I, I don't know. I really don't. It, that's, why, that's why I'm telling you guys to worry about it. <laughs> He asked what would happen if we cut entitlements by half. I think it would be, I think you'd have a lot of people who desperately need those without medical care and <clears throat> social security and things like that. So I, I think half would be a lot um, and you'd be pulling that money out of the, a lot, you'd be pulling a lot of that money out of the healthcare system unless it pivoted over to private care, you did something. I don't think these problems can be solved with like one big piece of legislation that hits tomorrow. I think they have to be layered in over time. I think you have to, you have to give people time to prepare for the changes. Um, and, and they sort of uh, to kind of migrate toward them. But I think, I think, 
I don't think you could cut it in half without a fundamentally different system to replace it. Did you have a pro question, sir? All right, uh, so a week and a half ago, Ray Dalio said that we're in the seventh inning of the economic cycle. Uh, currently, small business confidence is at record highs. What's your future outlook on the economic state of our country? So I, I just want to remind you, I told you that I wasn't an economist. <laughs> um, I think it's a hard one. I think, I think we're getting fueled right now still by the tax cut. I think that's a huge, um, it's a like gas on fire, right? Uh, you would never look to me for advice on your investment portfolio. Sorry, kids. I've got a couple of my kids up there. Um, uh, it just feels really, really frothy to me. The market feels really, really frothy to me. But, um, uh, you know, there are aspects about the world economy that keep us strong. I think we're still the reference currency. People still see us as a good investment. There are a lot of reasons why people are still coming. Often when I think things are going to slow down, they keep going for another couple of years. So, but it does, it feels seventh inning-ish to me. That's a tough question. So are we really past the crisis? Can it happen again? Um, I think the crisis that happened, I think it would be very surprising for us to see something like that happen again, because I think we have such a better comprehension of what's out there and so much visibility. However, I still get very concerned about this, and I think this could have a dramatic impact on our economy uh, and a dramatic impact on um, just the health of our country in other ways. But I don't see an explosion like we saw before because I, 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 it just feels like we have a better grip on what's out there. How are country, foreign countries or other institutions buying U.S. debt? How do they finance buying all our debt? Well, you know, China has a massive surplus, right? So China buys a lot of our debt. Japan buys a lot of our debt. Um, and that, uh, you know, results in sort of imbalances as well. But those, those, are, those are countries that generate a lot of um, surplus and they take that money and they invest it in our securities. And, um, you know, if you get in your econ classes and you, you look at all, ask your professor about different economic parity theorems and what it does to interest rates and all sorts of other things and you'll get a sense for how that sort of filters through the economy. But it, that, that's basically how it happens. And you know, you and I buy them and believe it or not, the Fed owns a lot of them. So, all right, I haven't looked at this side. I've got to pivot. <laughs> that they, they should be the lender of last resort, but what? Um, I think there is evidence that some of them were insolvent. I think the mortgage lenders were insolvent. I think when you look at Washington Mutual and some of the other ones, they were insolvent. I think the, you know, when you look at Lehman, I think may have been, right? I think when you look at Merrill Lynch, G Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, I don't think they were insolvent. I think they were illiquid. And um, I think that's where fear started going after those guys. So I think it was a combination of the two. But remember when I said earlier, confidence is an enormous driver. And I was talking to somebody earlier. I remember this. My second year uh, out of college, I was working at the First National Bank of Chicago. A few of you are probably around my age or maybe even older. And in a very short period of time, there was a big bank in Chicago. It was the most premier bank in Chicago called Continental Illinois. And within a series of weeks, it was gone because they had all these problem loans in their portfolio. A lot of their funding came from foreign investors. Those people pulled those loans, and the place came apart. Whereas First National Bank Chicago was mostly deposits, had better loans, and more stable. And so these things happen like that. And that's, that's, why, this, that's why this was so frightening. Because many of these things were not insolvent. They were illiquid, and that's where the fear came in. Do you think the next election in two months will have an effect on confidence? Oh, uh, I don't know. 
I don't know. I think confidence is, you know, it's really interesting right now because economic confidence is high, but confidence in the government in other ways is very low. I think that's a really very strange mismatch. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think, um, I think a lot of the big economic stuff that the president wanted to do was, I think the big thing was the tax package. And he continues to push forward with regulatory reform in many ways that we all don't see. But that really does loosen up the economy in ways that a lot of us don't see. Um, and so I don't think there are big, huge economic moves that he has on his agenda. Um, so if the, if the Congress goes to the goes uh, Democrat, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that people will say it's going to pull us back that far um, because it's not going to repeal what he's already done and some of that has fueled the economy.